Continuing on our section, uh, History of the Churches with the Protestant Reformation and the things that were going on at that time. Last week we started with uh, one of the um, primary figures of the Reformation, which is Martin Luther, and then focusing on Lutheranism. And today we're going to continue with some of the different individuals and groups that were, uh, churches that were started as a result of the Reformation. And, um, and today we're going to go into the Reformed churches, the Reformed churches, and we'll look at a couple of different uh, people who were a part of that um, movement initially in its beginning. Uh, the Reformed churches, uh, which are also uh, called uh, Calvinist or Presbyterian, was really the the first major denomination, so to speak, although there were different reform, different types of Reformed churches. And I was told by a person from a Reformed church that Reformed theology and Calvinism, Calvinism are not identical. Uh, Calvinism is a component of Reformed theology, but someone can have believe uh, what is called Calvinism, but not necessarily Reformed theology, such as there are... Um, there are uh, Reformed Baptist churches, which seems like a, a contradiction, but what it is, it's, the, the, it's Baptist churches that would baptize believers by immersion. They wouldn't baptize infants, but they still hold to certain points of Reformed theology. And so there are various, uh, uh, and then there are even ba there are Baptist churches where the pastor or it might be part of their doctrine uh, where they are more Calvinistic in their doctrine, but they are not necessarily Reformed churches. And so, um, uh, so we'll distinguish there between the Reformed and the Calvinist. Uh, but they were not started by one man, but rather a group of men, which is why we're looking at multiple people here. Uh, but there were a couple of key figures in that, or, or a few, and I don't think we're going to necessarily get all of them in this section, but, um, but we'll, we'll look at a couple of key figures. Uh, one uh, the um, Holdrich Zwingli was a Reformation leader in Zurich, Switzerland, and uh, the council, uh, when the Reformed teachings started taking root and the, the people really embraced it there in Zurich, the city council dissolved the monasteries and abolished the mass and image worship. Um, he, was, he was an ordained Catholic priest and eventually preached against Rome's errors. He eventually rejected the Pope and got married. And the city of Zurich followed his leadership and rejected Catholicism. I should have read that note here uh, after this point, that the city council, after his, with his leadership there, with him rejecting Catholicism, getting married and preaching against Rome's errors, uh, they, they followed his lead, um, the, the city of Zurich. He and, Zwingli intertwined his church with the government, which was a common thing with the reformers. That was uh, very, very, it was one of the common denominators of you had Luther do it, uh, Zwingli did it. Um, he drew up plans for a supposed model Christian community and compelled Christian belief and practice by force of law. Uh, and Zwingli is especially known. There were certain reformers that were known for um, persecuting Baptist people, uh, but Zwingli was one who severely persecuted Anabaptists, se severely. Uh, and and, so we'll, and we'll, we'll see some of that later in the section on the Anabaptists, but uh, Zwingli is one of those figures that um, really stands out in that way. And so, the, um, uh, so continuing on in, with Zwing Zwingli, uh, in 1531, war broke out between the Catholics from certain areas of Switzerland and the reformers in Zurich, because Switzerland was still heavily Catholic. Um, and some, some, um, well, let me, let me not jump ahead here too much. Switzerland was divided into 13 loosely federated states or cantons. Some cantons followed the Protestants, but others remained committed to the Catholic Church. The Zurich military forces were defeated, and Zwingli, who was a chaplain, was killed in battle. And uh, Zwingli's son-in-law, Heinrich Bullinger, took over leadership of the Protestants in Zurich, uh, but they were forbidden to spread their beliefs in the rest of Switzerland at that time. And so Zurich was very much a center of, of Reformed theology, 
and uh, reformed uh, the reformed movement as far as uh, Zwingli being the, the key. So w when we talk about a group of men, it had to do with particular locations. So you had Zwingli in, uh, in Zurich, and we're going to see John Calvin in Geneva. Um, you also had some others in different parts of, of Europe as well who were instrumental in the Reformed churches. Uh, so moving on here to John Calvin, uh, he is a very prominent name in the history of Presbyterianism or Reformed uh, theology. Uh, his, uh, he was a Roman Catholic early in life, but was never ordained as a priest. He became dissatisfied with Rome's dogmas and practices as he read the New Testament in 1533, professed to find peace in Christ alone. In 1534, he was caught by the French Inquisition and imprisoned for his faith. Uh, his brother was burned at the stake later that year with a group of 34 other Protestants. And... Um, and, and so he's really probably the best known and has the longest lasting influence in the Reformed churches, mostly as we're going to see because of his writings. Uh, he, he was a prolific writer. And so oftentimes those who were the most avid at writing, um, their writings lived on and, and ended up having a greater influence. He moved to Switzerland after gaining his freedom and published the first edition of his famous Institutes of the Christian Religion. He settled in Geneva and joined William Farrell in establishing a Protestant community there. Uh, so for Geneva, the, um, think of, thinking about what went on with Zwingli, uh, the city had broken with the Catholic Church in 1535 and had confiscated Rome's property. So kind of a similar situation there as what was happening in Zurich. You had the individual cities that were breaking away. Uh, a Protestant church was established which sought to implement Christian principles at the force of law. Calvin prepared a statement of faith which the citizens were required to submit to. So what you see here with the reformers is that while they did reject a number of Rome's errors, they did not reject all of Rome's major errors. Uh, and one of the ones that uh, they, they held on to was uh, the uh, practice of infant baptism and then also the merger of church and state, forcing people to follow their, uh, that religion, forcing people to follow that church uh, in that way. Uh, and they were submitting to their, to their faith. Uh, Calvin and Farrell wanted to establish a Christian theocracy in Geneva, but they were overruled. Calvin moved to Strasbourg for a couple of years. He pastored a French congregation of about 500 and married a widow. His only son lived just a few days. Uh, in 1541, Geneva asked Calvin to return to help them resist the efforts of the Catholic Church to regain the city. And he agreed to this and, as a result, had a powerful role in the new government that was formed. Calvin enforced Christian doctrine and principles at the, I should say, at the point of the sword. So, for example, in October 1563, Michael Servetus was burned to death for heresy. Uh, Servetus was a Unitarian, which is heresy. So this was someone, this wasn't a Baptist, this wasn't someone who had sound doctrine, but the point of being, because of his teaching, his Unitarian teaching, they're you know, denying the uh, divinity of, of Christ, the deity of Christ. Um, the Bible, so he was, he, he, was a, he was a heretic in that way. But the Bible doesn't command Christians to kill false teachers. Nowhere in the Bible um, are we as, as uh, New Testament Christians to um, kill false teachers. And uh, you know, now the Bible does speak of, in, uh, I think it's in maybe Second Peter, one of those uh, epistles there, um, where God will judge the false teachers. He will take care of the false teachers eventually. And they will give an account to him, but uh, Christians are not commanded to kill false teachers. We're supposed to mark those that cause division. We're supposed to identify them. We're supposed to avoid them. Um, but at the same time, never are we supposed to, by force, uh, do something uh, about false teachers. Uh, Calvin supported it along with Melanchthon in Germany, Bullinger in Geneva, and other Protestant leaders who were consulted. So they were okay with this. Uh, with him being uh, put to death. Um, he had a strong influence through his teaching 
and writings in those days and has continued to be influential. And I think, once again, a lot of that has to do with uh, his, the fact that he was a writer, uh, his Institutes of Christian Religion, that book still lives on uh, in, in influence. And so that, has, that, that doctrine has spread uh, quite a bit. Now it's worth noting that John Calvin was, he learned a lot of his doctrine from Augustine. So there's a lot of overlap there. Um, he was he was more influenced by Augustine, and so he kind of put it in maybe a uh, uh, different form. Uh, and, and of course, he didn't believe exactly everything, but there were a lot of main uh, there were some key areas where he was similar to Augustine, such as amillennialism. Um, so his uh, a summary of his most well known theology is known as Tulip. Now Calvin, in his writings, did not start that. He did not invent the tulip <laughs> uh, acrostic. Uh, that was something that someone made along the way to kind of uh, summarize his, um, his teachings. And same thing with, um, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a Baptist? And someone along the way made a acrostic with uh, uh, Baptist or some Baptists. And then somebody came up with Brapsis, which was weird. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. But anyway, Baptist, uh, so, so for example, Baptist, biblical authority, autonomy of the church, and they're all, they're all right, so I don't know how you ended up with the word Baptist or Baptists, because the last S is uh, Baptists, would be separation of church and state. So I don't know how that worked, but it, it works pretty well for Baptists. Uh, and then somehow um, Tulip was the one that came, was, was developed uh, regarding uh, Calvinism. And so oftentimes when someone says they are Calvinist, they are referring to believing some or all of these points of the TULIP doctrine, um, where if they are Reformed, they can be Calvinist but not Reformed. So if they just believe TULIP, that doesn't mean they, they believe in infant baptism, it doesn't, believe they, it doesn't mean they believe in amillennialism, uh, because as I said, there, were, there are Calvinistic Baptists, uh, who aren't Reformed in their theology. But just to go over here just briefly, the, um, uh, the tulip, uh, the first one is total depravity. Uh, it also um, is, is also referred to at times as total inability, and there's a big difference between the two because, uh, you know, someone can say, well, yes, uh, you know, mankind is, is, is depraved, so completely depraved. But the, the aspect of this total depravity means that uh, no one even has the ability to turn to God until he empowers them to do so. Um, so that's where the total inability comes in. And, uh, and, then that, and a lot of these build upon each other because then you say, well that, well, that doesn't sound so bad, but then here's the problem. The next one, the U, is unconditional election. So God elects certain people unconditionally uh, to salvation, but then he does not elect others, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so that's where that total depravity or total inability comes in, is that those people who, uh, you know, God didn't choose, well, they're, they're pretty much done for. I mean, they're, they don't have any chance whatsoever, because God's not going to enable them to be saved, and they're not part of the elect, so, uh, so it's pretty much that's it. Um, now, there are some Calvinists who... Uh, particularly Baptists who might hold some Calvinist doctrine as far as election, and they will say, well, I still evangelize because I don't know who the elect are, so I've, I've, got, to tell, I've got to preach the gospel. Then there are others who kind of get lazy about evangelism because, well, if God's going to save the elect anyway, well, then why do we need to do anything? But uh, here's a quote from the Institutes. God devotes to destruction whom he pleases. They are predestinated to eternal death without any demerit of their own, merely by his sovereign will. He orders all things by his counsel and decree in such a manner that some men are born devoted from the womb to certain death, that his name be glorified in their destruction. God chooses whom he will as his children while he rejects and reprobates others. That's in Institutes Book 3, Chapter 23. Uh, now, the pro there, there's, there's all kinds of problems with that statement um, when you match it up with Scripture. Uh, but let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We'll look at a few Scriptures here this morning. Romans chapter 1. And 
And uh, let's read uh, verse 16. Verse 16. Um, starting verse 16, Romans chapter 1 says, For I am not... I'll give you another moment to get there. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That is, is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in, in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now, stop right there for a moment. You know, I was thinking about that. Um, I, it says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Everybody has some awareness of there being a, a God. They might not know who God is according to what the Bible says, which is why it's important to tell people, but they have some awareness. And one example, there's an island, and I don't know exactly where this island is. I read about uh, just a group of people on this island, very primitive, jungle, uh, tribe, tribes people, and uh, they worship Prince Philip. They think he's a god or sent from their god or something like that. And Prince Philip is 99 years old and he just got admitted to the hospital. And um, He's also the one who said, this is a side note, that if he could be reincarnated or he would come back as a deadly virus to wipe out a bunch of the world's population. Um, but uh, anyway, they worship Prince Philip. And it had something to do with Prince Philip visiting there decades ago, and he met Queen Elizabeth, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure the whole story. But anyway, so then, then someone said, well, once whoever their god is takes him, he goes back to be with this god, uh, then they would worship Prince Charles. Um, but the point is, is that they have their god. They have a god, some sort of spirit, even though they're on some remote island somewhere out in the jungle, they have their God. And so many of them do. They have a God. And uh, not the God of the Bible. But uh, so we see that there's, there's you, you, if we're created by God, there, God made us with that recognition. You know, I'm made by something. I'm, I'm just not here by accident. The only reason people get to thinking they're here by accident is because, you know, by chance and evolution is because they've been taught that. But you don't just, you don't just, uh, in, in or, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, oh yeah, just there's, it's obvious this is all here by chance. I mean, no, that doesn't happen. It's, it's when it gets taught to people and passed down and someone dreams it up in their head um, and then they pass it along to others. Um, but the, but it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And then uh, going down to verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make, they made like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. So what does God do here? They, with having an awareness of their being God, did not want to glorify him as the God. And so therefore, the result of that was that he gave them up to uncleanness and all of the defilement and perversion. There are many times people will say, well, God's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't destroy America. Uh, now, there may be some places in America that are as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah, but I don't think America as a whole is as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah yet. It's getting there as far as our leadership is concerned and some of the policies that are being put into place. But... Uh, and then, of course, there are certain localities uh, that are um, more like that. But really, the, the fact that there is so much perversion, the fact that there is so much um, vile affections, lust of their own hearts, dishonoring their own bodies between themselves, that is already 
And yes, apparently, you know, eventually America will be judged if it keeps going in a wicked direction, but it's already part of God's judgment is him turning people over. It's a consequence for their rejection of him. And so, yes, there will be judgment of those, of those people. And then as a nation, the nations, uh, the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. And so there will be judgment. There will be uh, something that is uh, that God takes care of. But he turns them over. But he, he, the whole point was of creation and the creating mankind was so that they would recognize him and give glory to him. So by John Calvin saying that, oh, yeah, God just... Um, God devotes some from the womb to certain death that his name be glorified in their destruction does not match with the whole intention of the creation and him wanting them, everybody, to recognize him as the creator and that's what gives him the most glory. Um, and he's not there just wait, He's not there just saying, well, I'm going to decree you to hell and you don't have a chance from the mother's womb. Um, just, oh yeah, just so I can get glory. No, there's other ways God gets glory. And it brings God more glory and it pleases him more when people choose to recognize him as the creator, but here they did not do that. And that's why God gave them up. And look, so look in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So God's not decreeing when someone comes out of the mother's womb, yes, you are reprobate, I'm choosing you for reprobation. No, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. What's reprobate? Reprobate has to do with rejected or worthless. And so, and it has, it's a reprobate mind. It doesn't say the people themselves are reprobate, he gave them over to a reprobate mind because they didn't like to retain him in their knowledge. And that's what happens, that's what we see when there are uh, when it, we're seeing the outworking of that. It's just, you wonder, how, how can people even think the way they think? How can they even do the things that they do? It's so twisted, it's so perverted, because God gave them over to a reprobate mind because they didn't want anything to do with God. But he's not choosing them for that. It's just simply an outworking of their rejection of him. Um... And let's look at second, let's go to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And they'll say, um, some, some might say, well, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Well, what was that? That was choosing Jacob for his purposes of bringing forth the Messiah and, and, and developing the nation of Israel when he was rejecting that role for Esau. So it has nothing to do with a theology of, um, uh, of election in, that, in the sense that John Calvin is teaching it, or taught it. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, in verse, uh, let's just start reading verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there fall, come a falling away first, and that Son of Man be revealed the Son of perdition, perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called, or, uh, called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, uh, when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, notice this, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so he was able, the Antichrist is able to deceive the world because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It wasn't that they were preordained to destruction for God's glory. It's that they received not the love of the truth. They, they received not the love of the truth that they, might not be that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And so there is a point in time 
when God sends them that delusion, but it's after they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not, they, they did not accept that as, as salvation is called a gift. It's a gift. And so God's a pretty cruel God if he's giving the gift to some and he's purposely withholding it to others. That's not in keeping with what the Bible says. But then it says, verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So why are, why are, they, why are these people damned? Because they believed, not in, they believed not the truth. They didn't believe it. It doesn't say that. So evidently they had a chance to believe it. But they didn't believe it. Um, uh, turn to Second uh, Peter three nine. Second Peter three nine. And by the way, there are many people. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. We'll, we'll see if we can get through this here. Um, I'll save that for later. Second Peter three nine says, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Sl some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward." not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, the fact is, God knows who's going to be saved, and God knows who's, who's going to reject the gospel. God knows that. And so what this, whole, what this chapter is about is his, uh, his coming uh, to judge the world. You know, why does this seem like it's taking so long? Because God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. In other words, he's giving people space to repent. He's giving people a, an extended opportunity, a chance. And God knows that time when everybody who's going to accept it, is, accept that gift of salvation, has accepted it, then, then, all right, then that's the time. So God knows. He knows that. And so he operates within those parameters of knowing all things. But he's not saying to some, well, you just never had a chance in the first place. You were just preordained to, uh, you know, death and damnation. Um, without any, any opportunity whatsoever. Uh, then the next one, the, the L is limited atonement. Uh, that is that Christ's death was only for those who God would elect for salvation. And so, in other words, uh, when he died on the cross, he was specifically shedding his blood for those people who would be saved, that he would save. That he didn't actually uh, shed his blood for the lost, now, for those that were not a part of the elect. Uh, he says, when it appears that, that when the doctrine of salvation is offered to offer their effectual benefit, it is a corrupt prostitution of that which is declared to be reserved particularly for the children of the church. Now, it's one of the, one of the reasons, and maybe back in when he wrote this, and I was reading something more from modern day, that the idea is, well, if you, if you say that, well, Christ's blood was shed and he paid for, uh, the, um, for the sins of all mankind, then that really is leading to universal salvation type of teaching is what they're, what they're trying to avoid here with this doctrine. Um, and so that's a, that is a, uh, so on its face, it sounds reasonable because, well, you know, Christ, Christ shed his blood for, Christ shed his blood, but it was not effectual in that person's life. Well, and this is where, once again, it gets, it gets mixed up. Okay, he didn't, he didn't shed he didn't have to shed one more drop or one less drop of blood based on who was going to be saved or not. He shed the same amount of blood. He died the same death. And so therefore, it, it's not, that is not really an issue who that was for, saying that it was for everybody. Because if you take out some people and say, well, he was, it wasn't for the elect, he was shedding the same blood anyway. Now turn to, uh, well, we're here in 2 Peter. Uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Uh, it says in uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon, them swift bring upon themselves swift destruction. Turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 
So notice there, uh, the Lord that bought them. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the doctrine of limited atonement says, no, he was only the propitiation for the sins of the elect. And then they would, I've read something where they're, redefo- they're, they're trying to make the case where at certain places, and it's, it's maybe true in some contexts, not this context, uh, where, oh, world is just talking about a limited group of people. Um, it says the whole world. It doesn't even just say the world. It says the whole world. Um, and so and what's propitiation? That's not a word that, that we use a whole lot, but it's a very important word in the Bible. Not used much in the Bible either. It's used in Romans. Propitiation is not just dying for our sins, but dying for our sins in order to appease the wrath of the Holy God. So in other words, where God is ready in His justice to exercise His wrath and judgment upon those who are in their sins, Jesus blood, he, w- he shed his blood for our, through the propitiation, he's the propitiation for our sins, so he was that go-between, he's saying, look, don't put your wrath upon them, put your wrath upon me. This is where the Calvinism misses the main point, though, is that Christ's blood was certainly effectual and powerful enough for everybody but it does not actually take the effect completely until a person puts their faith and trust in Christ. And so they might say, well, you know, was Jesus shedding his blood in vain then? No, he didn't shed any more drops of blood for everybody, and he didn't shed any fewer drops of blood for just a few. He shed the same blood for everybody. He shed the same blood. No matter how many people it's for, he shed the same blood. And I will say, um, universal salvation really can come from the idea of there are people who said, well, everybody's sins were already forgiven on the cross when Jesus died. That's, that's a common teaching. That they were already forgiven, so a person just has to recognize they're already forgiven. Well, that's actually closer to universalism than saying that Christ died for everybody's sins and then you have to, but you have to believe to have it applied to your life. The righteousness, it's called imputed righteousness. And the way that righteousness is imputed is when you become born again, you become a child of God. Um, and I believe we're going to have to stop there. We didn't make it quite as far as I had prepared for today, but that's fine. We'll make it, we got through the T-U-L. Um, See if there was any more. Uh, well, there were there were some more scriptures. Let me just turn to First Timothy real quick. Um, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but I'm going to finish up this point here. So First Timothy chapter four and verse ten. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Especially of those that believe. Uh, John 3.16, well, might as well stop with that. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I, I, I understand the intent of the limited atonement doctrine, but it's unnecessary. Number one, it's not scriptural. It's, it's also unnecessary. Because Christ shed his blood, he was shedding the same amount of blood. He loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so he came to earth to die for the sins of mankind. So that penalty's paid. But belief is necessary for, for your person to receive that forgiveness of sins and imputed righteousness of Christ. And uh, we'll stop there with uh, tool. Tool. <laughs> T-U-L. Yes.